There was an art antique collector who was walking through town one day and he noticed outside the door of a general store there on the street, there was an old mangy cat that was lapping milk from this, this old saucer. He did a double take and his expertise told him that that saucer was very old and was very valuable. So he thought for a few minutes. Then he decided what he was going to do. And he walked into the store and he asked for the owner. He said, uh, sir, would you be interested in selling that cat? Oh, no, that cat's not for sale. I'll give you $5 for the cat. No, no, the cat's not for sale. Listen, I could really use a cat around my place to catch the mice. I'll give you 20 bucks for the cat. The owner said, sold, it's yours. He reached down, he picked up the cat, and he handed it to the man. The art collector took the cat and started walking out, tried to be real cool. He said, hey, by the way, I'll give you another 20 bucks for that old saucer right there. I mean, the cat's already used to it. it. Saved me from having to go get another one. The store owner said, no way, buddy. That's my lucky saucer. He said, I've already sold 68 cats this week. <laughs> Here's my question. What's valuable to you? What's, what's valuable to you? Is it cars? Is it cash? Is it antiques? Could it be people? Are people valuable to you? It was in early June 1995 when probably half of you were born and half of you were not. But early June 1995, the United States of America held its breath waiting to hear the fate of Captain, Air Force Captain Scott O'Grady, who had flown his F-16 over Bosnia and the Serbs had shot a missile at it and tore the plane in half. It erupted in flames. He ejected from the plane and parachuted down to a wooded area below and hid and survived for the next six days eating ants and grass just to stay alive. Every now and then he would send out a, a signal from a low-powered radio to let his brothers know where he was. Meanwhile, the United States was trying to determine a course of action and weigh the cost of rescuing one soldier. It would be a risky mission. It would be an expensive mission. How much fuel are they willing to spend to save one life? How much equipment are they willing to risk losing to save one life? How many more men are they willing to put in harm's way to risk saving this one life? And after all that consideration, they determine, as America usually does, whatever the cost, the one person is worth it. And we'll risk everything to go after one. So they flew a helicopter into that war zone and following the signal that Captain O'Grady had given, within two minutes they had landed the helicopter and found Captain O'Grady and got him on board and uh, safely flew out of that area. Obviously, you can see the spiritual parallel. I hope you can. All around us are people who have been shot down and without someone to rescue them, they will die in the hands of our enemies. They will die in the hands of captivity unless somebody is willing to rescue them. So my question is, how concerned are we about those who've been shot down? How concerned are we about those who have lost their way? How concerned are we about those who don't know Christ? Because this is what I realize. Most of us have a tendency to do this. I know I do. And we, we usually do it subconsciously, but we lose patience with people that don't think like us. We lose patience with people that don't believe like us. We lose patience with people that don't live like us. Even in church, we can fall into the same trap. We lose patience that don't attend church as regularly as we do. How dare they only come on Christmas and Easter? We're here every single Sunday. And then there's somebody else that looks at you and says, you know, okay, you come here every Sunday, but I give more than you do. How dare you not give as much as I do? How dare you just show up 
and go to church, but you don't serve in a ministry. And then there's somebody else that takes it up another notch and we keep whittling away, losing patience with people that aren't like us. And somehow or another, when we do that, we even do that politically, we do it racially. We lose patience with people that don't see eye to eye with the way we see eye to eye. We lose patience with people that don't regard what we think is valuable as valuable to them. And somehow or another, we fall into this trap of making a mental list in our mind of the, the people that we have patience for, that we have, value for, we have value for, must be the same people that God has value for. But look at the danger of this. That if we make this mental list in our minds, whether we're doing knowingly or unknowingly, of people that we have value for, and we lose value or patience for other people, how much risk are we willing to take? How much sacrifice are we willing to make to reach those we have no patience for? Probably not very much. And so we end up putting God in this box thinking God must not love them very much. God must not care that much for them because I don't care that much for them. Now, I know you're not rationalizing that, but we end up doing it kind of subconsciously. Proverbs 29, 18 says this. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Where there's no vision, the people perish. Where there's no vision, one version says, people cast off restraints. They'll lose direction. They'll lose their focus. They'll lose what matters most when there's no vision. So I'm going to give you vision for the remainder of 2019. I'm going to give you vision for what we're doing and what we should be doing every day and every week and every month for the rest of 2019. This is our vision. This is our focus so that we won't get distracted, so that we won't perish, so that we won't lose sight of what's most important. This morning, I'm going to talk to you about without vision People perish, but tonight I'm going to talk to you about without people, the vision will perish. It takes both. We can sit around and we can have a vision that keeps us on track, but unless we have people to embrace the vision, then the vision passes, the vision perishes, the vision goes away. It takes all of us. It takes both. So what's the vision for 2019? What's the vision? What's the big answer? What's the big focus? What's the one word? What is it? It's people. People. Why people? Because people matter to God. Come on, somebody say amen. People matter to God. Old people matter to God. Young people matter to God. Red and yellow, black, brown, and white, they're all precious in his sight. Jesus loves all the children of the world. He loves everybody. He loves the rich. He loves the poor. Loves the tall. He loves the short. He loves the skinny. He loves the skinnier. He loves every single one of us. He loves the millennials, and he loves the boomers, and he loves the Gen X, Y, and Z. and He loves every, everybody matters to God. And for me, one of the best places to begin to see the value of the lost is to understand how God values the lost. In fact, this became one of the main thrusts of Jesus' ministry, trying to help his followers understand the value of the lost. And he did it most effectively in Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, he tells three stories. The parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. He tells these three stories. Now, let me just give you a little setting here because Jesus has a crowd of people around him that are very irreligious. There's a crowd of people that have gathered around. They they would be considered uh, the, the bottom of the barrel socially. The lost. And then over here in another little huddle, there's a bunch of religious people, the religious elite. And they're standing over here talking among themselves, muttering underneath their voices because they're saying, how in the world could Jesus, who claims to be the son of the holy God, how could, be, he, he, how could he be hanging around with those people? 
I mean, if he's really the son of God, what is he doing associating with these sinners? He knows what they're saying. And so he takes this opportunity and he gathers the crowd. And here's what he does. He gathers the crowd and he begins to tell a story. He says, I want to tell you the story about a shepherd. There was a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and one of them wandered away from the flock and was lost. Do you know what the shepherd did? And most of the crowd leaned in, try to hear what the answer was. And he said, that shepherd left the 99 and tracked down the one until he found the one. And when he found the one that was lost, he picked up that one lost sheep and he brought it back to the sheepfold. And then he called the other shepherds and said, celebrate with me. My one lost sheep has been found. And Jesus looked into the eyes of the crowd that he was talking to. And he saw that some of the people got it, but not all of them. So he told another story. He said, let me tell you about a woman. There was a woman who lost one coin. She had 10, but she lost one coin. And you know what she did? People leaned in a little bit more. You know what she did? She lit a candle in her home. She got her broom and she swept every square inch of her home. She turned her furniture upside down until she found that lost coin. Then she group texted all of her friends and said, I found my lost coin. Celebrate with me. And he noticed that most of the rest of the crowd was kind of leaning in. There were a few of them still out there on their phones, disinterested, disengaged. So he said, let me tell you another story. Three stories back to back to back. Let me tell you one more story. It's a story about a father. He tried to appeal to the parenthood of those in the crowd. And he said, let me tell you, there was a father and he had two sons. And he's looking at him in the eyes. You have children? You have children? Yes. Let me tell you about a father who had two sons and one of his boys got this crazy idea that he would have more fun if he took his inheritance early and went out and lived his own life. So he found a fast crowd and he lived the fast life and, and he made, did some fast living and he squandered everything, threw everything away and he found out real quick that those friends that he had, they all ran away real quick when the money ran out. And he found himself in a pig pen trying to just make a living, trying to just survive. And all of a sudden he came to his senses and he realized how foolish this was that even the hired hands back at his father's home we're better off than him. So he made his mind up. I'm going to get up. I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to admit how wrong I was and just ask him to take me back as a hired hand. I know I'm not worthy to be regarded as a son. So he got up and he made his way back home and the father saw him while he was still a long way off because the father was looking for him. The father was hoping and praying and expecting him to return. And when he saw the son, the father went running towards him and grabbed him in the road and embraced him and put his arms around him. And the son immediately started saying, dad, I'm so sorry. I've made such a mistake. I've blown it. I'm not worthy to be your son. Would you just take me back as a hired hand? And the father said, shh, quit talking that nonsense. You're my son and your home. Let's celebrate. Let's kill the fattened calf and let, get a new robe for my son and shoes for his feet and a ring for his finger. Let's celebrate. My son was lost and now he's home. And at that point, I believe probably everybody was leaning in. Did everybody get it that day? I don't know. But I'm not really worried about how many of them got it that day. You know what I'm worried about? Do you get it? Do you get it? Do you get the message? If you don't, let me tell you what we need to get from these three stories that Jesus told back to back to back. There's three things I want you to understand and take away from this. And this is number one, all people are valuable to God. Everybody say that. All people are valuable to God. Say it one more time. All people are valuable to God. The missing sheep was important to the shepherd because that was an important part of his livelihood. The coin was an, valuable to the woman because that was a tenth of her estate. And also, most women in that day had 10 coins that were connected by a chain that they would use to wrap around their head to hold their headdress on. It was so personal and valuable to them that it could not even be taken away in the court of law. She lost that one coin and she wanted to find it because it made the headdress complete. It was a part of her that no one could take away. She had lost it and she wanted it back. 
It goes without saying how valuable the son was to the father when the son came home. So through these stories, Jesus shows us that all people are valuable to God. Now here's an amazing thought. There's nobody that you and I will ever, ever lay eyes on that's not valuable to God. No one. It doesn't matter how vile or wicked or bad they may seem. All people are valuable to God. Jesus shows us that when he's hanging on the cross, there's two thieves that are hanging on either side of him. And one finally recognizes Jesus is the son of God. Says, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Well, Jesus could have rejected him. I mean, what did he do to get on the cross? He had to be pretty bad. Crucifixion was reserved for the vilest of the criminals. He could have rejected him, but he didn't. He said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Why? Because all people matter to God. In each story, something of great value was missing. And here's the beautiful thing, that in each case, the individual that is of great value is up against the backdrop of the many. The one sheep against the 99, the one lost coin against the others, the one son against the rest. He, what Jesus is trying to do, he's trying to cut through our tendency to just categorize everybody as a mass. And he wants us to see the one. Are you hearing me? Thank you, John. He wants us to see the one because it's real easy for us to just kind of whitewash people as the world. For God so loved the world. Yeah, but there's one that you have a connection with. There's one that you're gonna come in contact with. There's one that's a part of your circle of influence. And that's the one that matters. Here's the second thing. That which was missing was important enough to warrant an all-out search. That which was missing was important enough to warrant an all-out search. The shepherd didn't stop looking until he found his sheep. The woman didn't stop looking until she found her coin. The father, although he respected the decision of his son, as soon as that son showed a hint of repentance, the father was quickly and immediately restored him back to sonship. Do people really matter that much to God? Yeah, that's why John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Why? Because he loved the world that much. Luke 19, 10 says, for the son of man came to seek and save that which was lost. A simplified translation of that says this, the son of man came to find lost people and save them. And then just before Jesus went back to the father, he said, as the father is sending me, I'm sending you. So now we have the privilege and the responsibility to do the same thing, to go after the lost. To go after the lost sheep and the lost coin and the last, lost son. Here's the final thing, and I'm gonna stop with this. The final thing that these stories should be saying to us that I hope we get is that when the lost is found, it calls for a celebration. Come on, we like to party, right? I mean, this, this should be the happiest hour of the week, Right? This is it. This is your happy hour. Celebrate. Luke 15, 10 says that in the same way I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. When one person repents and comes back to Christ, all of heaven begins to celebrate. Now listen, I believe that deep inside every single person here, you understand that we're on this planet for something more than just work a job, collect a paycheck, pay our bills, love our kids, and be upstanding citizens. There's got to be more than that, right? There's so much more. So I'm asking you to embrace the vision of people because people matter to God. Don't miss out on the people that God will bring into your life, you may be the only person they ever have a connection to Christ with. You may be the only door that opens them up. You may be the only opportunity. You may be the only light. You may be the only salt. You may be the only one. Don't miss it. Every day we have this opportunity. So I'm asking you to do something. You should have received a card like this when you walked in. If you did not receive this postcard that has three blank lines on it. If you would raise your hand, the ushers will get one to you real quick. Several here on the front row, back over there on the left. Just keep waving your hand, they'll get them to you. Right here, my mother didn't get one. There, get one from my mom. 
Just keep your hand up. I want everybody to have one of these here in the front. Crystal, right in front of you there. And then right back here, Terry, straight. Oh, there's more right up here in the front. Right back there on the left, Terry. Straight back there on the left. Go back. Keep going back. Keep going back. Keep going back. Thank you. There. Thanks. On this card, there are three lines. Here's what I'm asking you to do. You may not be able to fill this out right now. You may be able to. But if you can't fill it out right now, then I'm gonna ask you to take it and pray and ask who needs to be on these three lines. I'm asking you. Maybe you can think of it like this. Like the lost sheep. Do you know somebody who's wandered away from the flock? They may not have given up on their faith, but they've wandered away from the flock. I'm not asking somebody who's planted in another church. I'm not asking you to steal somebody's sheep. That's not what I'm asking. I'm somebody who's wandered away from the flock. They're, they've just kind of given up on church. Go track them down like the shepherd. Pick them up, bring them back. The lost coin, the second line, maybe somebody who's just lost somebody that does not know Christ, maybe somebody who's never accepted Christ, somebody you know is not a believer, I want you to put their name on that, lit, on, on that second line. On the third line, it could be somebody like the prodigal son. You see them in the pig pen of life. They've made so many wrong choices that they're spiraling out of control. They've allowed life choices to begin to destroy them. I want you to put their name on there. You could use that kind of thinking as you're thinking about people. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about people that are lost. And then I'm gonna ask you to start building relationships with them. Start being very intentional. Being, be willing to go where the religious people may look at you and say, what are you doing hanging out with them there? I'm building a relationship. I'm making a friend. And if you can't lead them to the Lord yourself, then use the power of your invitation to bring them to something like Easter weekend at Freedom Church. After that, you could bring them to the 4th of July celebration where we're just gonna have a big party. You can bring them to a friends and family day in early fall. You can bring them to our fall outreach. We will have opportunities for you to build relationships with these people and use the power of your invitation to get them here so that they can find Christ. And here's what I see. I see this. I'm so excited about this because I see this. I see these names that we put on here and then we pray over them every day. You're gonna keep this, but we're gonna be praying. We're gonna be very intentional. And then every Sunday, I see the opportunity for us to see one of the names on this card move to that wall. Every Sunday from this card to that wall, from your card to that wall, where people make decisions to follow Christ, and every Sunday we celebrate because somebody else has decided to follow Christ. Somebody else that was lost is now found. I want you to think about it. I don't want you to disregard me. Don't brush me off. I, I, don't tick me off. I ask, you, I ask God to open up our minds and our hearts to be receptive because I believe that this could radically change the way we do church. Because come on, we get so inner-focused. We worry about the set list. and we worry, I get tickled. You know, churches, I know it's cool now to use your Instagram, put your set list out there. You know, what? So we can decide if these are songs we like or not. We're such babies. Yeah, we're such babies. I mean, I, 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 sorry if Jacob's plan will put a set list out there. Sorry. We're such babies. I mean, is the coffee just right? Are there enough donuts for me? We are so spoiled. But what if we got driven and passionate about every week making a connection with somebody else and we bring them into this place, they walk in and they find Christ. They find hope. They find life. They find love. They find acceptance. They find Jesus. Oh my goodness. That's called revival. Revival. That's what I'm believing for. That's what I'm asking you to do. While you're thinking about that, and maybe God's putting names on your mind right now as you write them down, let me just, let me just tell you this. Louis Pasteur, most studied him in history or biology or science and something, the pioneer of immunology, 
during the time that he lived, thousands of people every single year died from rabies. If somebody was bitten by a rabid dog, they would die within days, weeks. He was experimenting with this new vaccination and he was just about to start experimenting on himself. When a young boy, a nine-year-old boy by the name of Joseph Meister was bitten by a rabid dog. And Joseph's mother pled with Louis Pasteur, would you please experiment on my son? Otherwise he has no hope. For the next 10 days, Joseph Meister was injected with that vaccine that had never been proven to work yet. But after 10 days, Joseph Meister lived and he continued to live. Decades later, when Louis Pasteur passed away, there were three words that he asked to be etched upon the headstone over his, his grave. Out of all the discoveries and all of the things that he accomplished, all the awards that he received, there were three words he wanted on his headstone. Only three words mattered to him. Joseph Meister lived. That one little boy lived, the first one that lived and survived because of that vaccination made such an impact upon his life. The power of the one. And let me tell you this, our greatest legacy will be those who live eternally because of our efforts. Our greatest legacy, it's not gonna be the car you drive, the house you live in, the how much money you have in the bank. No, the, our greatest legacy will be the lives of those who live eternally because of our efforts. Are you willing to make the effort? Are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to sacrifice so that one more person can be found? So that the one, let's not just pray for the masses, let's target the one. The one, there's somebody in your life, there's somebody in your circle, there's somebody in your neighborhood, there's somebody in your office, there's somebody in your family, there's somebody whose life could be radically, radically changed and that could be your legacy, that one life that is eternally changed because of your effort. And I'm asking you to embrace this vision. I'm asking you to take it passionately. I'm asking you to begin to pray and cry and weep over these names, believing that God is gonna save each and every one. It's so easy for us to get calloused and, and to think of it as just the mass, but Jesus made it real clear. We shouldn't just think about the masses. Let's go after the one, the one, the one is who matters. Can I get an amen? Would you do me a favor and stand to your feet and hold your card in your hand? As you stand to your feet and hold your card in your hand, I'm gonna ask our prayer partners if they will come and join me across the front. I want us to pray and I want us to ask God First of all, for divine direction. I don't want just random names. I want the one, the two and the three. I want, I want the one that God has divinely appointed and assigned us to connect with. Then I want God to remove all fear. Say, fear be gone. I want us to remove all fear and get rid of all fear that would hinder us from approaching somebody or inviting somebody or building a relationship or even the fear of what somebody else may say about us because they see us with someone. <coughs> We've gotta be willing to get rid of the fear. And then let's pray that God would give us the glue like Aaron talked about the glue that connects us with the people of France. Let's pray that God would make us the glue that connects people first to us and then to Christ. Oh, I, mean, I just, I see visions of names moving from cards to that wall, cards to that wall, cards to that wall. And every single week we're just celebrating and celebrating. Lift that card up and begin to cry out to God. God, give us divine connections. Give us divine connections with individuals that need to know Christ. Give us divine connections with those who you have assigned us to. God, make us the glue. Make us the glue that will help connect people to Christ because we know that our legacy will not be the things we accumulate, the things that we can purchase with money, but our legacy will be those who live eternally because of a price that we prayed, a sacrifice that we made. God, let it change the heartbeat of Freedom Church. Let it change the way we do church. Let it change the way we pray. Let it change the way we live. Let it change everything about us, oh God.
I ask you for souls. I ask you for friends. I ask you for the one. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Everybody say amen. Amen, amen, amen. Now listen to me. As we sing this final song, here's what I want to ask you to do. I don't want us to miss this opportunity to pray for any need that you have here today. I don't want us to miss this opportunity because I know that when people walk in this place, just like Bear said earlier, there's two types of people. Some that walk in, everything's okay. Some that walk in and things aren't all right at all. We always want an opportunity to pray. So I'm going to invite you, if you have a need, maybe you need healing in your body, Jesus is still a healer today. You've got a a direction that you need or wisdom that you need or a a mountain that needs to be moved. We want to pray with you. But along with all those that are coming, there are also those that need to have fear broken off of your life so that you can embrace the one. There are some of you that need divine direction to get to that one. There's some of you know without a doubt exactly what you got to do. And you just need the boldness of the Holy Spirit to help you get there. Maybe you're here today. And you realize that you can't really connect with the one until you connect with the one. Maybe you're saying, I need to make things right with Jesus. Then I invite you to come with all the others. and Let somebody pray with you and let's believe God for some miracles in this house today. So come on, while we're lifting up our voices, if you need prayer today, come on, get out of your seat and come. We want to agree with you for prayer right now. 